Welcome to Marin Voices and Views. My co-host Lawrence A. Strick is away today. I'm Peter B. Collins. Coming up in our second segment, we'll introduce you to a new kind of owl that can help us visualize the impact of sea level rise in Marin. But first, I'm happy to welcome Marin's sheriff and coroner, Robert Doyle. He joined the department as a deputy 45 years ago, working his way up through each of its three divisions. He was appointed sheriff back in 1996 and has been re-elected five times, most recently last November. A California native, he lives in Novato. Sheriff Doyle, welcome. Thank you for having me, Peter. It's nice to meet you, and there's a lot to talk about. First, could you give our viewers a quick overview of your department? There are basically three divisions, right? You have courts, custody, and patrol. Uh, close. Um, the uh, department's uh, budget is about $60 million. Uh, we're 300 plus employees and as you say we're broken down into three bureaus. One is field operations which is primarily patrol investigations and all of our support services to that. Uh, custody and, and, and uh, courts which is another bureau which is all of the jail and the jail is the only jail in, in Marin so uh, everyone who is lawfully arrested is brought to the county jail. Mm -hmm. And then the courts uh, statutorily where the sher a sheriff of every county is responsible for providing uh, security in the courts. And the third division is more of an administrative d division. It's our Civil Records and Warrants Bureau, mm -hmm. uh, County Communications. Uh, we, we dispatch for three police agencies and all of the fire agencies except for County Fire and the Sheriff's Office and all of our administrative functions, including the, the coroner. Uh, and the reason why the coroner's office is separated from line is because there was an issue when they were going to merge that there would be a conflict. And so the coroner division is strategically under administrative services and is actually a, a floor away from, from patrol and investigations, and that's a purposeful effort uh, on our because? part. Because? Well, there was, there was a, a claim that when the board was merging uh, the coroner's office with the sheriff operation that there would be a conflict of interest, that here we're you know, investigating crimes and potentially homicides or deaths in the jail, and, mm -hmm. and the sheriff was all the coroner. So we, we separate that. However, uh, if there was a, ever a death uh, that was related to the sheriff's operation, whether it be in the jail or field services, we'd always ask another county to do the, the mm -hmm. death investigation mm -hmm. to keep that uh, much cleaner. So. Now, you recently moved from the Civic Center to your own facility. Uh, how's that working out? And, uh well, I, I, it's fantastic. I mean, we, uh, we had a grand opening, so the public uh, had a chance to, to view it. And we were so lucky because it was not a ground-up building, which we would have been restricted, obviously, in, in cost and, and size. But the county took an existing building. Uh, they purchased the, the Marin Commons. Mm -hmm. It's still named the Marin Commons. And uh, <clears throat> gave us space, and so we were able to adopt that space within the budget. Uh, and so uh, we feel very, very fortunate. Uh, we'll, I don't think at least in my time and probably several people after me will, will never outgrow the space that we have. And, mm -hmm. and it's a very, what, what I'm struck by it is that it's, it's very office-like. It's not police-like, government-like. Uh, you People come into the building and they're just struck that it could, it could be an office for a law firm. It could be an office for an architectural firm. Mm -hmm. it's, and, and it's a beautiful building and they did a great job. So mm -hmm. we're, we're very, very happy. But people don't realize that the primary uh, impetus behind that was to provide a 24-7 um, facility for emergency operations and also for communications. And when the county first got into that, the, it wasn't cost effective to do it just for those two functions of the sheriff's mm -hmm. office. And that's why there ended up being a public safety building. And the cost per square foot in that building is one-third of what it would have been for a standalone across from the Civic Center. Mm -hmm. so. Great. So you're saving money and it's more user-friendly. Right. And hopefully the county will rent out uh, part of it and it'll pay for the operating costs in the mm -hmm. future. So. so over the years, Marin City has <coughs> presented challenges to your department. How would you rate the relationship between the Sheriff's Office and the population in Marin City? And would you regard it as improving? 
Well, I, to be honest with you, I never saw it as, as being an issue. I mean, I, I began my career in Marin City and, and spent probably the first 15 years of my career in a variety of capacity, eventually the station commander. And, uh, and unfortunately, uh, the, the community, you know, doesn't have a standalone leadership, you know, and uh, so w when things happen, there isn't, you know, a single entity that you can go to and, and, and uh, try to work through it. So, so that's what, you know, makes it difficult. All of the men and women who work in that substation want to be there because it's our busiest substation. Uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, the rapport with, with the community is, is, is very good. And I, I think what happens sometimes is that it, it gets incident driven. Um, I mean, I'll go to meetings and people will want to talk about what happened five years ago. Well, you know, my position is look through the, let's look through the windshield, not the rear view mirror. But, but I think all in law, I think a lot has been made of, of, um, uh, of the relationship and I think incorrectly. Uh, after the, the unfortunate shooting that we had a few years ago and we went to a community meeting and there were a lot of people that were unhappy but there were also a lot of people saying, hey look, we all live here, we're all responsible for what happens here. Uh, and, uh, and, and I've told people, you know, in that patrol area, uh, the majority of our calls for service are in that small community and, and, and those are driven by people who have been victimized by other people who live there. And, um, and sometimes I don't think people recognize that. They think that that substation is only there for that community. We provide police services to 20,000 people in the Southern Marin and all the unincorporated communities. So, so I, I think the relationship uh, is, is a positive one. Um, the station commander is involved in a, a variety of activities and groups in the community. And, uh, but can it get better? Of course it can. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so I think that the men and women who work there, there there's a positive attitude. People want to be there. When I, when I first started in the sheriff's office, you know, it was it was like Siberia. You know, if you did something wrong or you went on vacation at the wrong time, you got assigned to the substation in Marin City. Mm -hmm. I don't have enough slots for 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 the deputies that would like to work there. Interesting. So. In July 2013, a deputy named Evan Kubota fired 16 shots at an unarmed man in Marin City who tried to escape a traffic stop. He fired the deputy, and the suspect uh, has sued the county for $10 million. But the county personnel commission overturned your termination of <coughs> Deputy Kubota and gave him a desk job. Have you decided to appeal that, and uh, how do you express your reaction to what this uh, murky personnel commission did? Well, <laughs> it's kind of crazy. Uh, yes, yes, when the decision is final, uh, it is my intent to, to appeal the decision. Uh, secondly, I, I explain to people, uh, you know, we always get criticized in the law enforcement profession that, that you know, judgments like these should be taken from us. And, and here, um, I terminated uh, Evan Kubota, and I was overturned by uh, three of the people, three of the five that sit on the personnel commission. Um, Do you think in this case a citizen's review board might have sided with you and, and given a little bit more uh, community support to well, your decision? Well, generally citizen review boards uh, are not charged with that. I mean, they're just sort of charged with overseeing, uh, you know, issues and complaints. So I, I don't know, but I mean, here is five independent uh, citizens of Marin County uh, that sat in judgment, and, and I, I. I obviously think that their decision was incorrect. Um, I think that it was based on faulty, uh, faulty thinking, and um, so whenever we're presented with the final, their final decision, it is my intent to appeal. Mm -hmm. And uh, I understand that when there are personnel issues in play, that there are confidential, uh, confidentiality laws and also just practices to preserve people's That's privacy. Correct. And I, I would make, make no effort to crack that. But it is hard to understand uh, how these commissioners overturned your decision just given the, the facts of the case. Well, I, I agree. Uh, um, they, uh, I mean, they, they disregarded my testimony, the testimony of my undersheriff and other people uh, that investigated the case and, and how they, without any law enforcement experience, uh, interpret you know, I mean, basically they found that he didn't violate our use of force policy. Uh, they found that he didn't violate the shooting policy. Uh, but yet, and I can talk about this publicly because it is public, uh, but yet 
in his own interview several times said, if I had not gotten out of the way of the car, I would have been hit. Well, our, our shooting policy is very clear that you cannot shoot at a moving vehicle or from a moving vehicle unless your life or someone else's life is in danger. And it was my opinion and my decision that if you got out of the way, then your life was no longer in danger and neither was anyone else's. Mm -hmm. so. so in that respect, was he grandstanding? Well, I don't know what was going through his head. Um, I, it was his testimony that he thought he was going to be run over by the car. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. And if you could, could you summarize for us your use of force policy? And in particular, <coughs> when it's considered appropriate to shoot to kill as opposed to shoot to disable a, a suspect or a, a fleeing individual? Well, there's never, no one has a policy that says you shoot to disable. I mean, the only time you should le use lethal force is if your life or someone else's life is in danger. Uh, we, we don't have a policy, nor does anyone that I know of, that says shoot, you know, to disable. And why is that? Because, well, because it, it strikes me, particularly with an unarmed person, that, uh, you know, there are steps short of uh, taking a shot that is intended to be fatal. Uh, well, of course, and that's why we, we teach deputies in, in the art of verbal judo, talking to people. Uh, that's why they train regularly on, on defensive tactics. Uh, that's why they train regularly on the use of batons and also also our, our tasers. Mm -hmm. And we also have uh, stun guns. And so those are those are the non those are the lethal non lethal because obviously if someone got poked in the eye or whatever, but those are the non lethal that you're supposed to employ before mm -hmm. you use lethal force, which is your firearm. Mm -hmm. And did you use the Kubota incident to uh, reinforce these standards with your deputies? Um, well, I, I've never been um, uh, a person that, that, if the shoe fits, wear it. Um, it's not been a problem. Uh, I mean, I, I can go back in my career uh, in almost 46 years, and uh, weapons have been discharged a handful of times. And so I didn't feel it necessary to remind anyone uh, that was already doing their job and conforming to policies and procedures of the sheriff's office that they need to redo them again, so. All right, and what are your rules on high-speed chases, hot pursuit? Uh, again, the hot pursuit is uh, there has to be some danger imminent uh, or a supervisor has the responsibility and the ability to call it off or turn it over to someone else. Uh, so, um, I mean, each incident is, inc instance of a high-speed chase is different, so I can't say in this situation we would do this, in this situation we'd do that. So, so at some point when uh, you know, say for instance, some obvious scenario, you're driving through a residential neighborhood and, and you know, you see people on the sidewalk or you see people in the street or whatever and maybe a sergeant may say, no, call it off. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes we'll turn it all over to somebody else. As I said before the show, traffic is not our primary responsibility, so I know we have had chases on the freeway that we've turned over to the California Highway Patrol mm -hmm. because they have the resources and, and, and they're better equipped and trained than we are to do that. Mm -hmm. so. We mentioned earlier that the county merged the coroner's office into the sheriff's department in 2010. Uh, do you have any oversight of the autopsies or is this a completely hands-off uh, situation where it's kind of a distinct department? Well, it's under the sheriff's office, so it's, it's under you know, uh, um, my responsibility. And uh, there is a lieutenant who's in charge of the unit and he's the assistant county coroner and he has investigators and there's technicians and clerical obviously and then we have a, a doctor on contract, a medical examiner, forensic medical examiner who is on contract to us and Napa County. And so uh, uh, that has been delegated to him just like I delegate patrol responsibilities to lieutenants and investigations and that kind of thing but mm -hmm. ultimately it's my responsibility. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, your department's agreed to, I guess starting this fall, handle the 9-11 and dispatch services for Central Marin. Now it's a merged police agency and I live in one of those communities. And my concern is that we, you know, we live in a small town, but we've lost that personal contact with the police. And I'll give you a quick example. Recently, an elderly neighbor of mine was away and his smoke alarms went off and a police officer came and she didn't know who lived there, or uh, she didn't even know, for example, the nearby church where I told her she could probably find him on a Sunday morning. Uh, and I just use that as an example. These aren't, you know, uh, the most serious problems, but 
I have always valued the, the personal contact and true community policing. And I think that due to budget cuts and the consolidation, we're losing some of that. Uh, as you take over the dispatch, do you have any, any ways that you can address that? Well, well, I disagree. I think dispatch and who responds to calls are two different entities. Um, and so when we take over Southern Marin, or, or Central Marin Dispatch, we'll be dispatching the officers that work in those three communities. And so they should be de deploying, and I'm sure they are, you know, community-oriented policing and knowing where people live and those kinds of things. Now, obviously, when, when we start doing dispatch, we're going to have to get up to speed with, with the local things that go on, but that shouldn't change at all. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, so you should call Chief Cusimano and, and uh, tell, uh, no, I'm just kidding. But, <laughs> so. Last year, you opposed Prop 47, which was passed by voters, reduces sentences mm -hmm. for drug crimes. Uh, are you still opposed, and how has it impacted the county jail population? Uh, we, we've seen a, um, a decrease in, in uh, the average daily population, which is in part due to 47. And I think what, what I objected to was, uh, um, you know, not so much, I mean, uh, because Marin's the leader in alternatives to incarceration, and we've been doing that for the last 35 years, uh, was, for instance, making uh, theft of a firearm a misdemeanor. Uh, making, you know, uh, possession of, of what we know as date rape drugs uh, a misdemeanor. And so I was more concerned about that. And also, I, I think that, that most residents and citizens of the county don't recognize the nexus between drugs and theft. And, and now, w with all possession of narcotics being a misdemeanor, there's really, the, there's no drug courts anymore and there's no you know, carrot uh, that, you know, if you get convicted of a drug possession and you do certain things, uh, then everything will be okay. Now they're misdemeanor and why do they, why, why would they? In particular, you're talking about diversion to rehab? Right. So why, mm -hmm. why would they, you know, why would they do that when, uh, you know, they're, they're going to, they're just misdemeanor convictions. Mm -hmm. I, th I predict, though, in the end, that if people continue to reoffend, the courts are going to get tired of seeing Peter B. Collins, and they're going to say, this is the fourth time you've been here, so I'm giving you a year in the county jail. So I think that's going to catch up to us. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then also, like, where's it stop? I mean, do we, uh, do we next say, well, residential burglary, that's, that's related to drugs, too, and we, shouldn't, we, shouldn't, we should decriminalize that and make that a misdemeanor. And, so I, I, that's what I, what I questioned, uh, uh, that, that I, I didn't think that, you know, decriminalizing certain things was in the best interest of our society as a whole. So. Mm -hmm. Has anyone suggested privatizing jail operations to save money? Well, actually, in the, in the state of California, local jails cannot be privatized. Hmm. Uh, the state, state of California um, uh, does, does, I think, delegate some of their like halfway house kind of structures to, to privatize, but you can't in, in, in the county jail system. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it would, um, I don't know if they would save us money or not, although I think regional type jails uh, would save us money. Mm -hmm. so. Now I'm interested in your department's hardware. Um, mm -hmm. You have squad cars, SUVs, patrol boats. Do you have any aircraft? We have a uh, fixed wing 172. Mm -hmm. uh, that is uh, uh, out at Noss Field, mm -hmm. and we have a volunteer air patrol uh, that operates that, and we do, um, uh, you know, a lot of aerial things. Uh, for instance, the task force is following somebody, they may be up in the air following the car. Mm -hmm. uh, we often take new deputies in the field um, on aerial views of the areas that mm -hmm. they're going to patrol, use it for rescue kind of things, spotting and stuff like that, yeah. Are you interested in acquiring any aerial drones? Uh, you know, I've not, uh, you know, the only application I would see here would be for search and rescue mm -hmm. um, uh, more than anything else, uh, but I, I, I've not purchased any, nor do I have that mm -hmm. in, in my interest in the future. Do you have a stingray system? No, we do not. Uh -huh. Does anyone in the county? Not that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. uh, and just for our viewers, this is the cell site simulation right. that call, causes all cell phones in the area to report into it. Right. Mm -hmm. No, we don't. The, the, one, the only one that I'm aware of is in Santa Clara County, and that's only because they had a case and there was some criticism about the purchase of it. Oakland is in the news now. They've had one since 2006. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and what about your Bearcat? This is the armored vehicle that's drawn a lot of attention. It's hardened for nuclear and bioweapons. Uh, it costs 385 grand, but you got a screaming deal. 
because uh, the Department of Defense dropped it on you for, what, 35000 No, actually, it wasn't the Department of Defense. It was the Federal Homeland Security. Hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, yes, we, we, it was 360000 and and we had to match, uh, I think, 45. Um, I've heard it called a number of things, tanks, uh, it, it's, a, it's a tank and it's a... It's a personnel carrier. It, well, actually, that's, it, 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 yeah, a tank is something that's on tracks. This is on wheels. Um, we, uh, I, 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 I've tried to assure people that we were not competing against programs for, you know, the homeless or, or uh, um, you know, uh, health programs and that kind of thing. And, and uh, this was designed for this. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, we put in for the grant. They wanted one in this geographical area. And under the, the grant program, whatever we get from the Homeland Security, we have to share with our, our four, uh, four county uh, area, which is us, Solano, Napa, and Sonoma. Mm -hmm. And uh, w I think we've used it three or four times. We've used it a number of times in training. Uh, but it's a perfect asset, and we had interest in it. As I remember the uh, extended stay incident where there was a mm -hmm. guy who later committed suicide, but he was barricaded, and uh, we didn't have a vehicle to, to get people close to the front unit that he was in, and we mm -hmm. had the call, I believe it was Sonoma County. Um, so, so yeah, but I, I, uh, I, I think that, you know, you've seen letters to the editor, and I think if people told the truth, it's not an interesting letter to the editor, so they have to sort of fabricate what it's for. I mean, I've heard people say that the sheriff shouldn't be using that, that tank to patrol, uh, to patrol the streets of Marin. Well, I don't use it to patrol the streets of Marin. I've used it three or four times on some high-risk search warrants. Uh, and, and of course, then the first time I used it was in Marin City, and that was a racial, racial thing. And I tried to explain to people, we were looking for three people who were you know, alleged to have shot someone, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we did a high-risk search warrant in the area. So, so it's a, it's a it's a good tool, uh, and um, fortunately we've only had to use it a handful of times. And and uh, but if it saves one life, uh, or or helps one person in in a critical incident, uh, we'll have saved uh, uh, millions of dollars. In well, Sheriff Doyle, that's all the time we have today. I really appreciate you responding to our questions. Nice to get to know you. We'll talk again. Well, please do. Thank My you. pleasure. All right. Rising sea levels caused by our changing climate are predicted to impact Marin County in the not too distant future. With a grant from FEMA, Supervisor Kate Sears of Southern Marin is leading a project to help us visualize the impact and start a conversation about future planning for the parts of Marin that are at or below sea level. Maybe you've already seen the new owls along the bike path near Tam High in Mill Valley. We particularly chose this site because of the panorama it provides of both infrastructure and wetlands, but also because of the proximity to Tam High. And, and there is the space here as well. There's obviously a lot of things that go into picking an appropriate location. But because of you know climate change issues being so important, obviously, for our generation, but for particularly for our young people, we thought there was a real benefit in being close to Tam High. So kids could come over during their lunch hour. They could come over with science classes. We wanted to be on the multi-use pathway. The only locations we thought about were on this multi-use pathway because, obviously, this pathway is very heavily used by members of our community. We get people from San Francisco coming through. We get all different kinds of users. And so it seemed like a good spot, in, in addition to being an area that floods. Of course, one of the areas we looked at was Tam Valley. And when you look at those inundation maps, you really get a sense both of the potential inundation in that area and up into Mill Valley. Um, Belvedere is, is engaged in, I think, rather energetic conversations with FEMA right now about the inundation. Uh, in their areas, and then as you move up our county to Corte Madera, to the canal area in San Rafael, Nevado, we have a lot of area that's impacted. Aaron Selverston is CEO of Owlized, the company that created these owls in collaboration with Autodesk and others. Well, my background is in journalism, and I was a reporter for many years, and one of the stories that I covered was in Kiribati, which is a South Pacific coral 
atoll island nation. And I spent three weeks there eight years ago, 2006, covering, was that eight years ago? No, it was nine years ago, uh, covering the impacts of sea level rise on the, on, on the people there. And it found then, even nine years ago, that people were already really feeling those impacts. Um, everything from inundation and uh, their, their, their freshwater supply becoming brackish uh, to, you know, other, other serious issues like, you know, their, the fish that they were relied on uh, for food was migrating away because of the changing uh, sea surface temperatures. And so that's when I really first uh, became very passionate about the issue of, of climate change. And uh, six years later, when I first thought of the idea for the OWL, uh, one of the first thoughts that occurred to me was that this could be a very good tool for showing people the future of climate impacts. That's been one of the motivating uh, factors behind developing this technology is let's find a way to just show people what the future looks like because if we can show people not only impacts but also some response scenarios then not only can we we hope help people feel a sense of urgency about the problems and also a sense of hope. It's it's important with any issue that there is engagement, there's an opportunity for people to be heard and there's a degree of support uh, for whatever your project may be. That's certainly true in the housing arena, it's true in our trap, our efforts to solve traffic issues, it's true in, on our, our Share the Path uh, initiative that we've launched on this pathway to get people working together better it's true and on any parks and open space issue that we have and it's certainly true with our sea level rise issues it's crucial that there's an opportunity for everyone to get to engage, engage understand the issues share their views and I think with sea level rise it's really crucial because we're moving towards trying to talk about are there adaptation options that are appropriate understanding that there never is one size that fits all for any area of the county and and also understanding that undoubtedly going forward, trade-offs will need to be made. And so I'm excited about this OWL as a tool that really will facilitate that conversation because often it's hard to start the conversation, right? So I would like to invite uh, our residents of Southern Marin, our residents of Marin County, and anyone who passes along our multi-use pathway here in Mill Valley to come over and view our OWLs and see the future of sea level rise, consider some of the potential adaptation alternatives. Give us your feedback. Tell us what you think. The owls will be here on site at the intersection of Miller Avenue and El Monte Boulevard until August 10th. We then will convene a community meeting on September 30th to talk about what we have learned from the public, from everyone viewing the owls, and to share thoughts broadly and get the broad community's thoughts about the impact of sea level rise in our communities, adaptation options, what we're thinking, and ideas for how we go forward. So please, everyone, come, look through the owls, give us your comments, and come to the community meeting on September 30th. You can see some of the same visualizations online and sign up for updates on sea level rise. For Marin Voices and Views, I'm Peter B. Collins.